your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. While you're turning there, Exodus chapter 20, we are only going to cover six verses. And let me tell you why. The Ten Commandments are foundational, they're fundamental to the faith, and um, it was not right of me to rush through this entire chapter. So we're only going to cover two commandments this morning of the ten. While you're turning there, I'm going to begin with the reading of God's word in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1, it says this. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Verse five, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This is God's word. Let's pray one last time. Lord, we just pray that you would bless the reading and the studying of God's word this morning, recognizing uh, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Lord, we know your commandments, as the word says, are not burdensome. Lord, we know that we see this establishment in the Old Testament that breathes into the New Testament. When Jesus, you said a new commandment, I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this people will know we're your disciples, Lord. We see how they complement one another, both with the new and the old covenant. I pray that you would please bless this time in the word. And it's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I wonder how many of you grew up in a home where you had parents who would often make statements like, my house, my rules. You live under my roof, these are the rules. Like, they're the ones who set the law, you know? You break the law with mom and dad, it's not good. Or maybe some of you actually came to church this morning because you're like, my parents actually said that as we came to church this morning. Um, Sorry, but not sorry if you are here forcibly, whether you're a child or an adult. Rules and laws are interesting, especially in our day and age, primarily because rules and laws change are overturned. In fact, I came across this article that gave state laws and how some of them are so silly. And some of these laws are still in force to this day while others are no longer in force, but check this out. In Alabama, it's illegal to drive blindfolded. I know, it's like, well, duh. Keep your eyes on the road, right? In Arizona, check this out, It's illegal for donkeys to sleep in bathtubs. But I know some of you families that have been breaking this law. You know who you are. Just kidding. In Connecticut, a pickle must be able to bounce. What? Apparently in 1948, two men were arrested for selling pickles that were quote unquote, uh, unfit for human consumption. So as a way for them to discuss, well then, what should be the legal way to sell pickles, officials said that a pickle is legitimate only if it bounces. God bless America, right? Check this out. In Delaware, it's illegal to sell dog hair. I'm just looking at you guys to wonder which sociopath in here is like, oh, you're not supposed to? That's weird. In Georgia, it's illegal to live on a boat for more than 30 days. That's all right, I'm okay with that. In Kentucky, a woman cannot marry the same man four times. (laughs) Just don't ask, don't ask. Last one, I love this one. Guys, every single state needs to implement this next law. This is not jokey John right now, this is serious John. Ready for this? Best one, in Maine, it is illegal to keep Christmas decorations up after January 14th. Those who are not clapping that have left your Christmas decorations up all year, you should be arrested. I'm 
just kidding. <laughs> Here in Exodus chapter 20, we have the beginning, the establishment of the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And before we begin, I do need to preface this one thing right off the bat, that a question a lot of people are probably asking, and that is this. Does the Ten Commandments still apply to us today under the New Covenant? You ready for the answer? Yes and no. Whoa, I don't like that answer, Pastor. Well, think about it. No, because we live under the New Covenant established through Jesus Christ and the gospel message that's given. But we also know the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Like, I, I get that, right? But at the same time, and this is what's fundamental that you know right off the bat, the Ten Commandments cannot save you. They can't save you. I mean, we see it in the scripture, and I will elaborate more on this as we dive deeper into this, because just a heads up, this is gonna, we're going to be in chapter 20 alone between three to four weeks because of the content and the amount of things we need to talk about. But that is the truth. The Ten Commandments are given first, um, interestingly enough, as a part of the law. But as the Ten Commandments are given, we're going to see then instructions pertaining to the altar, how it's built, how it's supposed to be made. Uh, and, and both the altar and the law, they go hand in hand. Because think about it. There had to be an altar which had to offer a sacrifice for the shedding of, of the shedding of blood for sin. Think of it like this. Most of you have mirrors in your bathroom. Think of the, the law is like a mirror the mirror in your bathroom. And underneath that mirror is the basin that dis, you know, gives you the water. The point of the mirror is to reveal the dirt as you see the reflection on your face, on your hands, but the mirror can't clean you. It only can reveal what's problematic in terms of what you see. The point of the basin below the mirror, that's as you see the dirt, the water washes it away. And in the same way, just as the law is the mirror that reveals our sin, beneath the mirror is the wash basin to clean us, which is why, as I pointed out, the Ten Commandments cannot save you. And, and by the way, that, that was the point of the law and the altar pre-Jesus incarnate. Keep in mind, the law is divided up into two components. The law of God, you ready? And the law of Moses. Don't misunderstand the two. They're not one and the same. And yet, at the same time, they are. I'll explain. I know. It's just like, you're confusing today, John. The law of God is different from the law of Moses. They were both given at Mount Sinai, but the law of God is given here in Exodus chapter 20. The law of Moses is going to be given in Exodus 21 through 23. We're going to see the law of Moses established in the book of Leviticus. The law of God is referred to Paul in Romans chapter 7. The law, or excuse me, the, yes, the law of God is referred to Paul in Romans chapter 7. The law of Moses is referred to Jesus in John chapter 7. The law of God was given to three million plus people publicly and audibly. The law of Moses was given to Moses privately. The law of God was written by God directly. We'll see that in the 31st chapter. The law of Moses rec was recorded by Moses. And the law of God was preserved in the ark. Check this out. The law of Moses is not. I point these things out to give you a contest context to the contrast between the two. And we do need to differentiate the law of God from the law of Moses to remember this important truth. The law of God is for all people at all times, which is why the Ten Commandments is just as applicable. But the law of Moses was intended for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel. Does that mean you can't practice Judaism and you can't practice the ceremonies of Judaism? I mean, under the New Covenant, you don't have to, but they're still just as applicable historically and biblically, why they're given to us. But with the law of Moses, it deals with civil and ceremonial regulations for the people and the nation of Israel. And, and check this out, with Judaism, as it began to develop post Ten Commandments, came up with six 
613 different laws. Wow, right? Most of us can barely remember the laws of like Colorado, much less that, right? And of those 600 plus laws that they had to follow, 248 were positive. This is what you should do. And 365 were negative. This is what you should not do. And of all of these laws, they governed Judaism, Jewish life, the nation of Israel. And the Ten Commandments that we're going to study in these coming weeks, they're divided up into two major divisions. One part deals with uh, man's relationship with God, while the other half deals with man's relationship to man. Just as much as they're important today as they are moving forward. Well, you know, some of you might say, well, I, I, I don't believe in that. And, you know, we don't live under uh, the, the old covenant. And so the Ten Commandments don't apply to me. Yet if you murder someone, you're going to go to jail. And the Bible says in the New Testament to submit to the governing authorities of the land. We're going to see this throughout our study, how they complement each other. They don't conflict with one another. They complement one another. Like for another example, the Ark of the Covenant, what's inside of it? We know Aaron's rod is in there, manna, and what is the third item that's in the Ark? The stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. Is the law of Moses contained in the Ark? No. And yet it's still just as important. Because before God could systematically lay out this covenantal conditions before the Israelites, what we know as the Ten Commandments, before he could do that, God first had to remind them of what he had done for them. Read with me verse 1, won't you? And God spoke all these words saying, stop there for a moment. This is seriously why we are going to spend four weeks into this. In this, why are you stopping after reading only seven words? The reason why I'm stopping is because in this imperative moment in our study through Exodus, this is the first time ever God is speaking audibly to the nation of Israel. This is the first time they're hearing God do this work, hear him speak to them. They can actually hear what he's saying for the first time. Because in the past, uh, they heard through Moses what God had said. They'd seen the plagues and miracles that were done by God, but they've never heard God speak audibly. And the first thing, and this is what I want you to notice, the first thing God wanted them to hear was his law. Paul once said in Romans 7, 12, a verse many of you are familiar with, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. The law is that. It's good. It's just. It's holy. As I stated before, the, the, your commandments, Lord, they're not burdensome. There's something intended for us to know and to understand, how, not just how to live by, but the character of God. But for a lot of people, the law doesn't feel that way. The law, the Bible, the scriptures as we know it, 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 it feels burdensome. It feels quite the opposite. It doesn't feel good. It feels confusing. But that's not the case. And we know that because James 1.17 says, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Don't miss this point. Everything God says after verse 2, these Ten Commandments, are gifts. They're not ten rules. If anything, I want you to think about them like this. They're, they're, they're ten freedoms intended to help us understand and shape why we should do what we do as a society, as a culture, unto our relationship with God. Jesus fulfills all that and praise God for that. But they're not these regulations. They're sets of freedoms and I'll and explain again as we get through each and in, in every individual commandment. But like I said at the beginning, the Ten Commandments were never given with a thought that you will earn your way into heaven by keeping them, or at least attempting to keep them. The covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai was much bigger than the law itself. Because another aspect of the covenant, the sacrifice that had to be given 
both God and the Israelites knew that it was impossible for them to keep the law perfectly. And that's why he establishes the altar, why he establishes a sacrificial system, because no one was going to be able to keep it. And then you come into Jesus' time, and we're still unable to keep it, which is why Jesus is a fulfillment of it. Because he took upon himself to be the perfect sacrifice for all mankind's sins so that you, hearing my voice right now, can understand that you don't have to be good to get into heaven. Keep the Ten Commandments to get into heaven. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. Accept the fact that he died for you because he loved you. Because he knew you were worth it. The Ten Commandments, as we're going to see here, was always intended to reveal the sin. They can't save you. But that's where Jesus is the best thing ever because Jesus can save you. And your attempts to be good isn't going to fix it. Only Jesus is going to be able to be the, the supernatural spiritual water basin to not just, listen, not just temporarily remove the sin, but wash it away so that you are, oh, he separates them, as the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. He casts your iniquities into the depths of the sea. It's a beautiful picture. In fact, Jesus being the fulfillment of the law under this new covenant is established in the New Testament. And speaking of the New Testament, did you know the Ten Commandments are still mentioned numerous times? Like, for example, Jesus spoke of this. You guys are familiar with this story. Matthew 22, 35 through 40. Someone tried to stump Jesus, right? We're going to stump Jesus with a question that's going to corner him. Listen to this. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is, which is the great commandment in the law? Because they know whatever he says is going to contradict itself. And so Jesus said to him, Well... You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest great commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Now, this might be really easy for us to hear, but imagine you are a practicing Jew hearing this for the first time who is used to 613 laws, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus just summarized it in two. That had blown their mind. That had to have just conflict with what they've been taught growing up up until this point that Jesus just summarized it in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. Which is why Jesus consistently said in relation to that, hey, by the way, a new commandment I give you. And they're like, but you said the two already. No, no, that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this, people will know you're my disciples. It's still consistent with the two other commandments that he's given here. And the simplification of those commandments doesn't eliminate the Ten Commandments. It fulfills them. It shows the heart and desire of God for his people. And as exciting as it is to be under the new covenant, the whew, we don't have to live under the old sacrificial system and the establishing of the 613 plus laws that are given yet we still struggle with the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave. We struggle with loving each other, man. It's like not within our nature to do it. And another thing to know, which is funny, a lot of people don't even remember the Ten Commandments. Before some of you are like, before he looks at me and asks me to name them right off the spot, I'm going to give you this sneak, quick preview. What are the Ten Commandments? I'm going to list them right now. Here we are. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall make no idols. Three, do not take the Lord's name in vain. I'm paraphrasing it, of course, because of time. Four, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Five, honor your father and mother. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And ten, you shall not covet. Which, interestingly enough, I came across an article that stated that more Americans, check this out, can name the ingredients of a Big Mac than name all the Ten Commandments. Whoa. 
This survey asked a thousand Americans, it was done by the Kelton Research. It was undertaken to help promote a movie that came out in 2007, The Ten Commandments. Some of you are looking at me like, what movie came out in 2007 called, called The Ten Commandments? It was a cartoon and Christian Slater played the role of Moses. Some of you are looking at me like, I don't remember it. Yeah, a lot of people don't because it was that bad anyways. Um, but they did this survey in order to promote the movie and the vast majority of the survey could easily name the primary ingredients of the Big Mac. And a lot of us might immediately say, well, that's not fair because of like promotion. And remember, those who remember, even though I was born in the 80s, there was a jingle in the 70s that McDonald's came up with. Do you remember it? All two, two all beef, patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. You guys remember that jingle? <laughs> That's, and, and now you got this jingle stuck in your head, right? And then a lot of people were able to name those ingredients. And then when they were asked about the Ten Commandments, by comparison, check this out. You shall not kill was known to fewer than six in ten response. Less than half, 45% could recall the commandment, honor your mother and father. 69% remembered you shall not steal. But McDonald's, all beef patties, and lettuce got more recognition from the survey group, 79 and 76% respectively. And as you're looking at me, you'll be like, you know what would be really great, John, is for us to begin studying the Ten Commandments instead of you taking your slow pace and studying through Exodus chapter 20. Well, before God can give the commandments, though, he makes a statement in verse 2. Read it with me. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He's reminding them of something they knew all too well, but he's going to remind them nonetheless. And maybe some of you, again, grew up in a home where you had a mom who liked to remind you how difficult you were when she gave birth to you. It was so hard giving birth to you for hours. And then you'll be like, how many hours, mom? And you say it ignorantly, right? And then she's like, well, it felt like 7,000 hours. It was during a snowstorm of 112 inches. I had a bounty out against me, but I still decided to give birth to you anyways. And you know why moms do this to their kids? It's when the kids are being disrespectful, ungrateful, little turds, you know, just like, you know what? I gave birth to you and you should be great, you know, whatever it is. But on a serious note, parents in the room, it's hard to discipline your kids because you love them so much, but you see the value behind it. Separate from discipline, you understand why you need to set up rules in your house. Guys, it's because I love you that you need to follow these rules. It's because I'm protecting you. What a weird age we're living in that we have to protect our kids in a way that we never even would have thought about a decade, two decades ago. That we have this perverse time where people are predators looking for kids. And so you set up these rules in your house in order so that they're protected and it may come across as unfair to them. But you do it because you love them, right? And either they grow up and they rebel against the rules or they grow up and they thank you for the rules. Parents, don't, I don't want to lose you right now. Listen, whether you're in the camp of kids running from the Lord or you're in the camp of kids that are embracing it slowly, remember you are accountable to God with how you raise your kid. And even though you might be in this moment looking at me like, man, I, I failed in raising my kid, but God can take the years the locusts have eaten and redeem them. Reunite that relationship with your kiddo. Show them that they're loved. They're adults now. They don't, they're not going to listen to me, but you can love them now. And for God, he's coming before the children of Israel. He's about to establish the Ten Commandments. But before he can even say any of that, he has to remind them of where they were and what they came out of. The Lord wanted them to see that before the Ten Commandments are given. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He's going to take this time right now to show that they are a select group of people that God made a covenant with, with Abraham hundreds of years before this moment. 
that in that time frame, God wasn't like, oh, I forgot about that promise I made. No, he, he has made this special covenant and promise with the, Jews, the Jewish people, his chosen people. And with his introductory statement before the Ten Commandments, he establishes this to the nations. I redeemed you out of the house of bondage. What does that mean? That means they were under the oppressive rule of, of Pharaoh for 400 years as slaves. Hey, remember? I, I, I delivered you from that. He was the Lord their God, and they were his chosen people. And if they accepted this, then they needed to understand what the first commandment was. With that said, read verse 3 with me as we enter the first of ten commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. A better translation is you shall have no other gods beside me or over and against me. I mean, so that might make a little more sense to you in terms of what God is communicating. God's saying like, listen, I'm God. You're not. I'm unique. I stand alone. There is no other God besides me. So this is why you should not and cannot have any other gods over me or beside me. And I, think about that in light of the culture they just came out of. The Israelites were immersed in polytheism. They were immersed in a culture that worshipped not just one, but multiple gods. And saw multiple different sacrificial systems and multiple forms of worship. And the first commandment that we are seeing logically flowed from the understanding of who God was and what he had done for Israel. And because of that, nothing was to come before God. And he was the only God they were to worship and to serve. So it makes sense why God establishes this as the first one. The practical reason is because all the other gods, all the other goddesses that they were familiar with and worshiping in Egypt, listen, listen, they were fake. They were fake. They weren't even real. I love Psalm 15's description that kind of highlights this point that I'm making. Listen to this. Psalm 115, 5 through 8 says this. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Noses they have, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they don't, do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. I can't help but to think of a mannequin as they're making this description. Like you're in JCPenney, you're in like H&M, and you're looking at the mannequin. And the absurdity to worship it is crazy. But the, the psalmist is giving that description. Yeah, it's got eyes, but it can't see. It's got hands, but it can't handle. It's got ears, but it can't hear. And it, by the way, if you like basically make them as an idol, <laughs> so is everyone who trusts in them. You are not to have any idols. And keep that in mind because it, this wasn't just an Old Testament issue. We see it in the New Testament. Do you remember the story that Jesus gave, said when he was speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well? Actually, before we go to that one, remember the story of Jesus wandering the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan tempts him. We know this. There's a portion in the story where Satan takes Jesus over a mountain, shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world in all their glory. And do you remember what Satan said to Jesus? He said, all of this could be yours. If what? If you would bow down and worship me right now. And what was Jesus' response? Matthew 4.10, Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. If Jesus had a microphone, he would have dropped it and walked away in that moment. But that's what he's doing. He's making it perfectly clear that God is the one true God and he is to be worshipped and worshipped alone. That's why you are to not have no other gods before me. It means God demands to be more than just added to our lives. We don't just add Jesus to our life, the life we already have. We give Jesus all of our life. It belongs to him now. You were bought with a ransom price, his blood shedding for you 
is the price paid for you. I'm not my own anymore. And the moments when I think I'm my own, isn't it funny when the Lord reminds me? But I bought you. But I saved you. But I, ransom, I, I became the ransom sacrifice so that you wouldn't have to be a slave to this anymore. But human nature, our human nature is like an idol factory that operates constantly. We're always dealing with the temptation to set all kinds of things before God, allow certain idols to compete with God and take this preeminent place of him. And I'm going to say something that you guys already know, but I'm going to say it anyways. God does not want to compete with others. He has set the tone. You shall have no other gods before me. That's why Jesus said in Matthew, it's not going to be on the screen. I was thinking about this before I came up. Jesus said, no, no one can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon or money. You can't have two masters. That's where the inconsistency comes. And with that, the first commandment flows perfectly well, even though they're separate, with the second commandment. Read it with me. We're going to read verses 4 through 6. And we're going to break down verses 4 especially. And I am going to take a little more time next week to break down verse 5 and 6. But look what it says. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, verse 6, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." I want you guys to complete the sentence in your mind of a statement that I'm about to make. Here it is. Complete the sentence. You ready? I picture God as, and then fill in the blank in your mind. How do you picture God? It's an interesting question, especially if you were to ask our culture, how do you picture God? I think you would get a million different answers. It's always, though, been funny to me that people have a picture of God without ever reading the word of God. Sometimes they'll base their decision on what Hollywood has told them or articles they've read that has no biblical reference whatsoever. Well, I picture God as this. Well, have, have you read the word of God? Well, no. And it's funny to me, I mean, it's not funny, it's actually sad. A lot of people in the Western evangelical church, this common picture you see every time you're in Mardell, you're in a thrift store, of how people picture Jesus in the Western church, this Caucasian, blue-eyed, muscular, for whatever reason, carrying a lamb over his shoulders, Jesus Christ. Why is he muscular? Because he was a carpenter. I know lots of carpenters, and they're not muscular. But why have we done that? Why have we taken this westernized view of who Jesus is and how he looks? How do you picture God in your mind? And some people might say, well, I don't picture God as a him, but a her. J.I. Packer, who's brilliant, by the way, put it this way. He once said, metal images are simply the consequence of mental images. And there might be this artistic expression, you might say, John. Well, this is how I'm interpreting it. That's artistic, but not being biblical so much. Well, okay. I... But here's the thing. People will make images based on their mental conception of how they view God and the God they worship. So that's why I'm saying when you should complete in your mind the sentence, I view God as, what is in that blank? How do you fill in the blank? Because here's the reality. How you view the Bible will paint the perfect picture of how you view God of the Bible. When you read the word, what comes across to you both God in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Because we will either take what God has said about himself in the revealed word of God and all that we know concerning his character and his nature, it's derived from biblical revelation. Or we decide to just get rid of all of that, have nothing to do with it, and now we're just left with our own imagination. Or what Hollywood tells us God is 
which is far worse. It's far worse, you guys. I think God is, I picture God as, and so forth. But the first commandment here in Exodus 20 says that God was to be worshipped exclusively. Then it makes sense why the second commandment would tell us that God is to be worshipped correctly. If the first commandment tells us the whom, then the second commandment tells us the how. This is who we are to worship, and this is how we are to worship him. And don't miss this. God wants to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped separate from this time we put aside for audible worship. And he wants that. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, the Bible says. But he wants to be worshipped in your marriage, man. He wants to be worshipped with how you spend your money. He wants to be worshipped, in, in, for some of you, in your time of singleness. He wants to be worshipped in the way that you think, in the way that you react, in the way you read his Bible and his word. He wants to be worshipped. And if the first commandment is against false gods, then the second commandment makes sense why it's against false worship on the true living God. So when I see this second commandment, you shall make no idols, I, I, that's where I can't help but to think of the conversation Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember, he said to her, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so if God is spirit, and you want to worship God, okay, well then I need to worship him in spirit and in truth. And with that said... Like I said, I want to break down these verses to help us understand what that means. Next week we'll spend more time because I'm going to run out of time. But I want to talk about two things. Number one, first of all, the prohibition itself. The command itself, you shall make no idols. What does that mean exactly? And number two, so the first thing, the prohibition. The second thing, the problem. That is... Why do people even break this commandment? Why did God think it was so important to make it two of the ten? Why should it be top two or number two of ten? In fact, if I were to ask each person in this room, hey, I compiled a list of ten different bands, and I want you on this list to write who they are from best to worst. Do you think every person in this room would come up with the exact same list? Of course not, because it's all based on preference and style. Your list might look completely different from my list, but we choose music on the basis of powerful memories, moments in our life, life when we first heard it. Because like even now, I can play a song, and then you just traveled back in time to 1980. Or wow, you just traveled back in time when you saw the Beatles live in the 1960s. Or that first song you walked down the aisle to. Brian Adams, everything I do, I do for you. I watched Carolyn. No, 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 it was Jeremy Camp. See what I did there in front of everyone? Beautiful maker, Jeremy Camp. Our first dance was Brian Adams, everything I do, I do for you. And some of you are like, that wouldn't make it on top of my list. In fact, some of you, if, you, if I gave you the list that I compiled, you'd be like, I don't agree with the list that you compiled here. In fact, I don't understand why you didn't put Garth Brooks on here. I would say to you, first of all, everyone knows that country music never makes it on the top 10 favorite music lists. Oh! <laughs> everyone knows that punk is not dead and country music is just noise. I'm just kidding. Before you throw cowboy hats at me, hang on, hang on. But you know, this is the point that I'm making. It's okay if you like country music, whatever. It's okay if you like the fun punk rock music. RMB, I don't, that's not the point of the illustration that I'm trying to make right here. The point that I'm making is that people treat the Ten Commandments that way. They're subjective. They agree with parts of them and not all of them. This doesn't apply to me. This is offensive. This commandment is offensive to me. But that's not how it works. They're not the Ten, com they're not the ten Suggestions. They're the Ten Commandments. And if all Scripture is, in fact, given by inspiration of God, then we need to look at it as that. Why is it here? You shall not make yourself a carved image. Okay, so then historically it makes sense. It's gravitating toward the people that were making these little false gods, these false idols, three-dimensional, something derived from wood or stone or whatever it might be. You, you shall not make yourself a carved image of any likeness. 
of anything that's in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water underneath earth, you shall not bow down to them to serve them. Well, what does that mean, though? I want to skip ahead just for a second. In your Bibles, we're in Exodus 20. Go to verse 18 with me. We're just going to skip ahead. At this point, the Ten Commandments have already been given. All ten are done. But watch this, Exodus 20, verse 18 through 23. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, the flashes, the sound of the trumpet, right? After the Ten Commandments have been given. And the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled. They stood afar off. They're freaking out, right? They said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses, he drew near the thick darkness where God was. Watch this, verse 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, look, what is, look at this comment. You have seen what I have talked with you from heaven. Did you get that? He didn't say, you have seen God. You have seen that I have talked to you from heaven. Verse 23, you shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver, or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves I, I mean, what a spectacular sight this must have been. They saw the lightning. They heard the thunder. They heard his voice speaking. But they didn't see any form whatsoever. So how do we reconcile this? Well, like I said, when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, if you worship God, you worship him in spirit and in truth. John 1.18 supports this. Listen to this. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made himself known. So the general idea is because no one has ever seen God, any attempt to recreate him is pointless. We know in the, in the Gospels when Philip is talking to Jesus, saying, show us the Father, show us the Father, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But the problem with us as a people is it's hard to trust in something we can't see. It's, it's genuinely hard to relate with someone that you can't see because we're visual people. Samuel said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We look at the outward appearance because we're visual people. I mean, how do you have a personal relationship with someone you can never see? And that's hard. Isaiah 45, 15 says, Truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And even Moses will make a statement, Lord, just show me your glory. I've seen your acts. I've heard your words. I've seen the thunder. I, I want to see you. And a lot of us can relate with that. Maybe one of your kids has made this comment and statement with you. Like, mom, are you sure God is really up there? And moms, you're like, I'm sure he is. And then your kid will look at you and be like, but like, don't you wish, mom, he just like poke his head out every now and then to kind of show himself? And, and like, well, oh man, what the faith of a little kid, the questions of a little kid, but guys, we do the same thing. Oh, Lord, if you would just show yourself, which is why Every Christian, if you've ever wondered why Christians long for Jesus' return, this is it. I, just, I, need, I need to see him. I need to see him. I live by faith and not by sight right now, guys, but I need to be able to see him, which is why Titus 2.13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, because at the bottom line is, at the end of the day, people want to see and touch Jesus and one day you will. And one day you will. And one day he will return in glory and every eye will see him. He will come in within the blink of an eye. And everything will be revealed. And until then, we walk by faith and not by sight. 
We trust in the promises of his word. We depend on what his word says. And this is why, guys, we have to read and know the word of God. And I, I want to elaborate a little more because I'm running out of time. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 20. I'm going to read through this really quick. This is important correlating with what we're reading here in Exodus 20. Take careful, heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure. He's warning them, right? The likeness of a male or female, the likeness of an animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything, any, creeps, anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. But the, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt to be his people and an inheritance as you are this day. Man, what a continual habit you see with the children of Israel. Well, you know, falling at the face of God, running from God. Going to God, running from God, going to God. And the command that we're seeing here in order to avoid this is so that don't make any idols. Which means, well, what? Should we not go home and make little carved images? Well, I definitely think that. But simply put, an idol guys, is anything or any one that replaces God. You know what? I'm going to elaborate even more. It's anything or any one that takes supreme devotion away from God. That's an idol. You can drive an idol. You can live in an idol. You can date an idol. You can marry an idol. And you can raise these little things called idols. And you can even carry around this device that's intended to make phone calls. That can be an idol. You're getting my point. The list goes on and on. If anything or anyone takes supreme devotion away from God and onto it, that is an idol in and it of itself. Guys, I've run out of time. I gosh, there's these moments that I wish like we can talk for hours, but you look at me and you're like, I drink so much coffee. If you don't hurry up, I'm going to kill you, which is one of the commandments that you're telling us not to do. Let's invite the worship team up, but let's give this final thought. Israel came to Sinai 50 days after the offering of the Passover lamb. The spirit at Pentecost came 50 days after Jesus was offered as the Passover lamb. Think about it. Both of these events took place 50 days after Passover. Both involved violence, the violent shaking of a violent wind. Both involved fire. Both involved the writing of God and his law. The difference though, ladies and gentlemen, is that the fire at Pentecost was intimate and personal. And we are no longer confronted by God's power. Listen, listen. We're now indwelled by God's power. God no longer writes his law on tablets of stone, but etches them onto our heart. And I don't know about you guys, I am so thankful for what God is gonna do as we study through this more thoroughly. And I am so thankful for the old covenant, but I'm so thankful that we are living under the time of grace under his new covenant, when he shall return. And ladies and gentlemen, he is going to return. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the, the promise of why it was given. We trust in you. And even in this moment, as we're going to take time to devote to worship, as there's probably a lot on our mind and there's a lot we're thinking about, in this moment, would you take every person in this room to calm their hearts and reflect on why the Ten Commandments are given. They're not ten obligations, they're ten freedoms. And you freed us so that we wouldn't have any other gods before us. You freed us so that we wouldn't have idols in our life. You brought these things about so that we can live in such a way that's not reflecting how good of a person I am, but Lord, how good of a God you are to save us. 
we need your guidance. We need your help. We need the teachings of your word to help us understand the character. And we don't want to ever picture you as anything separate from what the Bible has already revealed. And so now we know if we worship you, we worship you in spirit and truth because you are spirit. There's so much that I don't understand about you, God, but just in this moment, would you please calm our hearts as your Holy Spirit dwells inside us to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name.